Thank you. I have um, about 15 minutes to convince you of uh, that the future of democracy is on the line, which is uh, actually feeling much easier than it did when I first put this presentation together, because I feel like that's actually what Van, Brewster, uh, Craig and others have been talking about. That's really what we're here to talk about. But I do want to speak directly to the funders in the room. And I'm, I owe Craig Newmark many debts. One is the Twitter bio that I use, Philanthropy Wonk, was taken directly from the first time I heard Craig, Craig proudly introduce himself to a room, a full room as a nerd. I thought, wait, I can take a little pride in what I do too. But also because uh, on Craig and Oscar Wilde's advice, I'm going to talk directly to you about what I think you need to do. I wasn't planning on making it particularly funny, but apparently I need to or you're going to kill me. Um, so I'll do my best. Um, let's see. Here we go. Three words for what I think is at stake here. But first I want to try to convince you that the way you work in your organizations as funders, actually democracy depends on how you do this. It's that important. Um, but we can also get there. It's not meant to be that scary. We can actually get there. So this is the world that we live in. It's one of ubiquitous digital data. Brewster can give us the uh, terabyte, petabyte measurements of what they've collected at the archive, but uh, the, it's just expanding at all times. And it's coming from all places. I'm talking about digital data. I'm not using the buzzword big data. I'm talking about the stuff that has been digitized and where it comes from. It comes from satellite imagery. It comes from our mobile phones. It comes increasingly from sensors built into our environment. Yes, that's a picture of a dumpster in Philadelphia that's hooked up with a solar powered smart meter to collecting information on what's going on around it and inside of it. And of course, the data can come from inside of us. Our DNA are increasingly available to be collected, digitized, and used in a variety of ways. And all of this stuff, uh, Brewster and Craig and others can give us the technical, technical explanation of what happens, but when we digitize it, it becomes interchangeable and mixable and generative and fabulous and wonderful. And we need to understand what's really possible with that resource. So some of the digital data that's being collected about us, we're very aware of. I think increasingly we understand as individuals that when we click on things or when we text things, that there's a trail being created. Some of it is being collected without us knowing about it. And all of it is being, collect is being stored by third parties, either governments, businesses, or nonprofits. And none of us know what it's like to live in that world where all of this information collected by us, some of us that we were aware of, some of it not so much, is being held by those third parties. Because none of us have done it yet. We haven't lived our whole lives in that world. But that's, where, that's the world we're living in now. It's the world we're raising our kids in. This is what we're afraid of. Now, uh, the author Mylan Kundera wrote this in 1985, so he wasn't even just talking about big data. He was talking about what happens when we lose a private space. The hell that he's writing about is really the opposite of democracy. Democracy depends on a private space, private spaces. So is the end is, is a thing, a phenomenon, this world we live in, where there's this ubiquitous digital data collection just fundamentally in opposition to democracy? I hope not. And I don't think it has to be. But we're going to have to, as, was, uh, as was Brewster was quoted earlier today, encode our values into the systems we build. They don't just naturally align. We have to actually design them that way. 
And democracy, it's nice to think about it this way, is a designed system. And so are technologies. And so we can design them to be mutually reinforcing. They don't have to be at odds with each other. The danger to democracy is not just that there's all this digital data being collected about us. It's that we as individuals don't actually have much or any visibility into what's happening with it. So we may be becoming aware that it's being collected. And we may be actually deliberately generating it and choosing to share it. Many of us are about many things. But we don't necessarily know what's happening with it, what those algorithms are being, do, be, being used for, or what they're actually selecting for, what they're adding and subtracting. But we, as people in a democracy, don't have much visibility into what's happening with that. And one of the things I know about democracy is that it requires participa participation and visibility and scrutiny. That's what our systems exist for. That's what the press as an immune system does. That's what it's doing, is providing visibility and scrutiny into the systems around us, both commercial and government. So solutions like this, and this is actually a joke, but solutions that are offering up the marketization of digital data, our own private ownership of it, and our ability to sell it to others, that are being funded by folks on this road and studied by scholars at Stanford and MIT and all over the place. This will be a new buzzword. This personal data ownership, it's taking off. It might work, I don't know. But it's not a democracy issue, this is a market issue. This is a capital issue. So if it works, if it does something, if it makes a big change, it's not necessarily gonna address the, dem the democratic problem, it's gonna address the capital problem. Keep your eyes out for this. And if you, were worried, if you wanted to know just how much the individual pieces of you are worth, there's Sam Potts' version of it. Democracy requires that kind of privacy. It requires the place to, to uh, scrutinize and understand how decisions are being made and to inform those decisions. It requires something everybody in this room is very familiar with, freedom of speech, and freedom of the press. The right to speak and to write what we think. Some of that other people will think then we will hate and collectively the system works because it's a check on itself and on power. But we need privacy so we can speak publicly. The freedom of thought is essentially the undercurrent for the freedom of speech and the freedom of the press. The freedom to be wrong, the freedom to come to understand what you think. That freedom of thought is a precursor. And it's not alone. There's another dependent clause in that famous first sentence. It's coupled with the freedom of assembly. This altogether is what is the basis of this democracy and most other liberal democracies. A place where we can generate new ideas, where we can learn from what's come before, where we can disagree and protest without violence, and we can hold the powers that be accountable. That revolutionary technological thinker Alexander Hamilton described civil society, the place where we do these things, where we live these freedoms, as the place where we protect ourselves from the tyranny of the majority. That's what civil society is, including philanthropy. We're the place we come together by choice to use the things that we control to benefit others. I got a bumper sticker for this. It's called Voluntary Association for Private Resources for Public Benefit. Sounds better if I say it's where people come together and do things that help other people. But, you know, you need more syllables when you're around the corner down there. So, ubiquitous data, ubiquitous digital data, threatens privacy, 
Without privacy, we lose free speech, expression, and assembly. Without those, we lose civil society. Without civil society, we lose democracy. So what are we going to do about it? We could step out of the digital age. Just give it up. We're not going to use digital data. We're not going to use infrastructure. We're not going to use the gadgets. Give away your phones. It's not going to happen. It's not even a good idea. It's a stupid idea. Because there's an awful lot in these technologies that are profoundly positive and that we want to use for good. So we need to figure out how to bring these things together. So I want each of you, please, to think about three things. The, eff the ethical, safe, effective that I started this with and how you actually do your work. It's not the whole answer, but it's a start of an answer. Focus on consent. People choose to use their private resources for public benefit. Civil society and philanthropy are about choice. Consent in digital speak is an opt-in process. Imagine your entire organization and its work being built around opt-in consent, human-centered consent. Let me tell you a little a quick story about this because we're very unused to this. We have not, we have rarely, when we navigate the internet, rarely have an opt-in opportunity. It's almost entirely opt-out. And all of you have participated in what's known as the biggest lie on the internet. Anybody know what it is? I agree. Click. You didn't read it. Right? There's another way. There's another way. Sage Bionetworks is a non-for-profit research firm it's doing a study on Parkinson's disease with some, a number of medical schools and some clinicians and a company few uh, towns down in Cupertino, maker of Jessica's watch. They figured out a way that what they care about was consent, that what they needed was a way to get people to understand that everything they did with this phone generates data, and that was in fact exactly the data that they needed for their study on Parkinson's disease, because Parkinson's presents itself in tremors. And boy, here's a, a permanently attached to us tremor register. So they created a consent process that makes it so that you have to do all the things the phone and the watch can do in order to sign in. The consent process is laborious. It takes two minutes. Being in the study is easy. They've signed up 10 times more people into this study than have ever been signed up in a Parkinson's research study before. The fear that making the consent process visible and difficult would keep people away has not been realized. Thought number two, don't collect what you can't protect. Now, the instant reaction to this is probably, well, oh gosh, I can't collect anything then, right? Because we know we're not very good at protecting this stuff. I didn't get this in time to make a slide of it, but this is my own personal copy of a letter now sent to 18 million Americans from the Office of Personnel Management telling them that my information, I worked for the government for six months in 1988. Here it is, I've been hacked. Right? We can't protect it. So the, it seems like the corollary of this would be, well, then we can't collect anything. But no, that's not what I'm saying. We need to figure out how to collect what we need, use it for what we're trying to do, probably destroy it, but, and do all of that with the consent of the people from whom we're gathering it. Again, Sage Bionetworks wants to know for the medical research how far, how much exercise do people get every day. The easiest way to do it is to use the default settings of the phone. After all, we know it tracks everywhere you go. But they don't want to know where you went. They want to know how far you went. So they rewrote the algorithms. They don't collect the location data. They just collect how far you went. If we can get creative, we can actually collect what we need and put people in at least less danger. Think of it, again, since we're on Sand Hill Road, as minimal viable data collection. Third, last one. And it's got two parts. And it might come as a surprise, given, privacy, uh, given consent and not collecting too much. But the third one is to be open in what you do. Privacy is usually positioned as the antithesis of open. But what I'm trying to get people to understand is that it's the precursor to open. If you actually get people who sign on and care about the public benefit you're creating and agree to share with you what they are sharing and you're not collecting things that are going to put them in danger, then you can open it up. 
And that's the mindset we need to be entering this world carrying that mindset. The second part of open is because it's our role in civil society to make sure that our democracy works by allowing us some visibility and scrutiny into the way others are using this digital data. That is our agenda. It's why we exist. It's part of all of your purpose to engage in that and understand its importance. What happens if you do this, these three little things, consent, careful in your collection processes and opening up? You get to go to Louisiana. There are three pretty simple ideas, but they actually will reinvent your organizations. Right now, most of us as foundations, most of us as nonprofits are actually not too far from what we see here. Analog institutions floating in a digital sea. You know, it's floating. It's not bad. It could be worse. But I'm not sure I'd want to really, you know, head out into the ocean with that. We need to reinvent nonprofit governance. We need to reinvent philanthropic practice. These are three basic principles drawn from what we know about digital data and aimed at reaching its potential, that if we actually built them into our core practices as organizations, we would begin to reinvent our organizations, we would begin to reinvent civil society, and we will save democracy. Thank you. Could you be a little more explicit about why you think privacy is so important for freedom of press and speech. I didn't quite understand the link you were making there. So it's private space. It's a place that's unsurveilled, where you can have conversations and examine ideas that you might not otherwise examine, and that might not be being you know, represented by the majority opinion. So there's a, there's a phrase for it of intellectual privacy, but that's a little too snooty for my taste. It's where we want to come to our own, make up our own minds. And if we can't do, if there's no place in digital space that's essentially unsurveilled, that is the, what we do there, the data are being collected on us and someone is holding it, then there's no private space for that. Amazon announced on Friday, Craig had so many great things that happened on Friday. Here's something that's not so great that happened on Friday, I think. Amazon announced that it was going to pay publish, people who publish self-publish books on Amazon according to the number of pages people read in those books. Was there any doubt that they could track how far you were reading in that book? <laughs> now they're going to be paying people on it. This is why, as Brewster's mentioned, librarians have been such defenders of this for so long. That pri space for private thought helps us then step forward and express ourselves have the ideas we want to carry forward, some of which will be, become the majority, some of which will forever be being fought for in the minority. Thank you. Lucy, do you, do you um, find or expect that expectations of privacy are changing in different populations and that there are some who are understanding to some extent what they're agreeing to and it's a transaction, they're giving up certain privacy in return for the, the watch we saw. Two-day free shipping. Right, right, exactly. So um, there's actually a new study off, out called the trade-off fallacy that says that even that may not be what's actually happening. So yeah, our expectations of where and how privacy, what it looks like, I do think are changing. I do not think it's a simple generational thing. I think that is a vast misunderstanding of what's happening. Um, I think we actually don't understand it a great deal. Um, I also think there are people who knew this was going to happen 30 years ago. And that's why the Electronic Frontier Foundation was created in the early 90s. So um, I think it's a complicated thing. I think there's a lot of exchanges we're going to have to navigate as we work through this world. And I also think if you go back to my bumper sticker about civil society, private resources for public benefit, private data for public benefit, if our part of that value exchange is going to be the public benefit, it, uh, it's up to us to define how you're going to actually make that exchange. Because I don't know that any of you are offering two-day free shipping. Are you? <laughs> Sign me up. 